long enough already. Um, what I was just sharing was that um, our summer has been a little bit chaotic. We, uh, we've done some pretty nice trips, but we've also uh, been in the middle of, if you haven't heard, we are in the process of selling our house and buying a new house up in Oregon to move up there to be closer to family. And so I don't know if you've ever sold and moved and bought a house and the escrows and all that is chaos enough, but moving out of state adds quite a bit on top of that. And to make matters even more crazy right now, um, Chris and I work in an industry for Hollywood that has an unprecedented double strike just wrecking everything. The Actors Guild and the Writers Guild are on strike and it's putting a lot of income in jeopardy. And it feels, it's one of those rare moments you feel like you actually have an enemy, right? Like some big force, these, these executives wanting to hoard all the millions and billions of dollars and literally tweeting that they're totally fine with people like going hungry and not being able to make rent because of this strike. And so it is a strange moment where the Psalms seem to come to life more. And there's a lot of Psalms that actually do mention enemies. And we might find ourselves where we read those kind of going, yeah, you know, David was surrounded by, you know, bad guys, enemies with swords and, and horses and whatnot. Yeah, those are enemies, cool. If you ask me, most of the time, you might be like me and you might say, I don't really have enemies. Sure, I've got people I don't get along well with, maybe. People I may not like too much. But when you use that term enemy, it often feels like too extreme. I don't really have any enemies. But when we stop and kind of think about the situations we have throughout the world, things that we pray about every weekend, where we pray about the entire world at large down to our very communities, homes, and, and individual lives, we can start picturing actually some enemies out there, like foreign enemies, right? Enemies posed against our way of life here in America, communist countries, North Korea, Russia, jihadist groups like ISIS, right? Okay, cool, we, those are enemies, but th those, are, those are overseas. Well, no, we think about enemies here. There is human trafficking that takes place on American soil. There's gangs in our own neighborhoods and they perpetuate lots of problems, violence and crime and drugs and graffiti and whatnot. Okay, wow, those are, those are actual bona fide enemies right here. And then for some of us, we might find ourselves rather entrenched on a certain side of the political aisle and might start labeling those on the other side of the aisle enemies. Even if they aren't breaking laws, we might see them as a threat to our way of life. And then therefore they might be enemies or the, the leaders of other political groups we might label as enemies. Some of us might even go so far as to call the IRS or our landlords, or folks at the DMV, right? Or maybe, maybe doctors that give you bad news and you don't like their diagnosis or how they do things, right? And you know what I'm saying, right? There, there are, we have individuals and people groups in our lives, big and small, far and near, that has a great deal of contention and conflict, and we all have them to some degree or not. And we know that that causes stress, anxiety, fear, keeps us awake at night. It steals our peace. But wait, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, is he not? And isn't he Lord of Lords, King of Kings on the throne running the world? Why is it that he's the Prince of Peace and we see so much opposite of peace around us? Why are there still so many enemies? We are in a period of time that you could call the now, but not yet. His kingdom is now, but it's not yet fully realized. It's not yet acknowledged by humans and spiritual powers alike around the globe. So Jesus is king, but we're waiting for this moment where he does overthrow wickedness and, and set these problems in this world right. And as the song, as John Mayer sings, we keep on waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. Are we not? We're waiting on that. 
But we're not just waiting for the world to change itself. We know that's never going to happen. We're waiting on God to fix and change this world. But how do we not grow weary in that waiting? And I think as we do wait for God to set things right and to overthrow forces of oppression and darkness and evil, our enemies, the Psalms are a great place to look. And today we're going to be reading Psalm 9. And I think this is going to help us get into a, a frame of mind on how we cannot grow weary waiting for God's restorative justice to be fully realized around this world. Psalm 9. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name, Most High. When my enemies retreat, they stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my just cause. You are seated on your throne as a righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have erased their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to eternal ruin. You have uprooted the cities, and the very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he judges the world with righteousness. He executes judgment on the nations with fairness. The Lord is a refuge for the persecuted, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you, Lord. Sing to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Proclaim his deeds among the nations. For the one who seeks an accounting for bloodshed remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the oppressed. Be gracious to me, Lord. Consider my affliction at the hands of those who hate me. Lift me up from the gates of death so that I may declare all your praises. I will rejoice in your salvation within the gates of daughter Zion. The nations have fallen into the pit they made. Their foot is caught in the net they have concealed. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed justice, snaring the wicked by the work of their hands. The wicked will return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten. The hope of the oppressed will not perish forever. Rise up, Lord. Do not let mere humans prevail. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Put terror in them, Lord. Let the nations know they are only humans. Lots of thoughts, lots of things we could even talk about there, but I felt called to highlight three main truths, three things that we can try to keep in mind to not grow weary waiting for that ultimate justice of God's to come. And first one is remembering Yahweh. Second one is not forgetting Yahweh. I'll talk about that. And third is singing the correct tune. All right, first, remembering Yahweh. The, the, the psalm opens with, I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name, Most High. The psalmist opens with just exuberant praise, saying that he is going to thank the Lord with all his heart. We have a concept of heart that's similar to how it's uh, thought of in the Bible, um, you know, where we think of it as like center for something, a place of feelings and emotions. But biblically, it's that and more. It's also a place where we might also attribute things to the mind, where decisions are made, where we actually focus and, and think, we determine with our heart. So, so thanking God with all his heart is not just a feeling, though it is, but it's also a decision. I will thank the Lord with, with my choice. I am choosing to do this. I will declare all your wondrous works. We're going to talk about remembering God's works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name. Why just name? Also, biblically-minded uh, authors 
name means something greater than just what somebody is called. It's what somebody is. The name actually kind of, it conveys essence. It, it, it conveys that this is that person. So there's more kind of tied up in name than just what they're called. It's, it's, it's who they are. And so this is singing about who God is. And what's interesting is right after that, the psalmist doesn't actually say Yahweh, right? I will sing about your name. And then he calls him Most High, which is a word that comes from Hebrew, uh, El Yon, which means the Most High God. Throughout Genesis, before God introduced himself to Moses at Mount Sinai and said, I am Yahweh, he was known as El Yon. He was known as the Most High God. The idea that Elohim or spiritual beings are governing the entire world, who's governing them? Governing them, the Most High God. And so right here, he's, the, the psalmist is focusing on what God is as the most sovereign, supreme. He has the final say in every matter. He is the most high, right? He is the top dog. Uh, so, so name, name is, we're going to get to name, but knowing what God is, is, is incredibly important, right? To know that he is who he is, that he is El Yon. But if you're on an airplane and that airplane hits some serious turbulence, knowing that there is a captain flying the plane is comforting to a point. But imagine, if you will, that the captain flying that plane was your father, right? You had a relationship with this father. This father is a pilot who has a great track record, has always flown things well, has always been responsible, and even promised to you that we're going to land this thing safely at our destination. And then you hit some crazy turbulence, and I have a feeling you would have a lot easier time just taking a nap. Dad's got this, right? Dad's flying the plane, and he knows what he's doing. So, eh, what's a little turbulence? I think knowing what God is is really important, but knowing who God is is taking us to the next level. Knowing is also in biblical thought an intimate thing. It's not just knowledge or data in the brain, it is experience. It's knowing by experience. There's a moment where Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac and he doesn't because God stops him. But he says, God says, now I know that you fear God. How did the all-knowing omniscient God not know? It's not the same thing. God knew, but now he's experienced. He knows it by, by having been through it with Abraham. Abraham has now demonstrated it and God has been there with him in it. So knowing the name of Yahweh is more than just like, yeah, I know what we call God. is That's his name. It's Yahweh. I got it. It's actually knowing him. It's experiencing God. It's, it's having a, a, a deeper relationship with God. When I start a new job, one of the scariest things for me is not being known. If on my very first day, I just screw up terribly and nobody there really knows me, now I'm known as the screw up, right? That's what they're going to think of me as. What I really hope to do is come in there and let people know who I am. That I would be somebody who I want to be known as somebody who's dependable, says I'm going to do something and does it, you know, shows up on time, is pleasant to work with, those types of things. And that only happens through experience and time spent together. And then if, say, I do have a mistake, my coworkers and bosses can give me a little more benefit of the doubt. They go, that's, that's not Cody. We know who he is. That's, that's not him. Now, I'm not saying God makes mistakes, but clearly there are going to be moments or have been plenty, that we don't understand what he's doing. Case in point, the fact that we've been waiting 2,000 years for that ultimate justice to come. And we go, but God, you look at these Psalms. You bring justice. You're supposed to be setting the world right. You're supposed to be overthrowing wickedness. Why aren't you doing what it seems like you're going to do? But I know you, and so I can trust you, even if I don't fully understand what God is up to. 
knowing, experiencing is going to help us build that trust. Um, I think I skipped it. There, yeah, verse 10 of this psalm says, Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you, Lord. So we want to know God. Now, God demonstrates who he is throughout the Bible, cover to cover, but there's this great passage in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, that he brings Moses into a deeper understanding, a deeper experience of who God is. And it goes, Yahweh, Yahweh, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. That is an amazing list of character traits. And we go, okay, so right now we're waiting and we know, okay, God's slow to anger. He is compassionate. He brings forgiveness. But he also is going to bring that justice. So as we're waiting, remembering Yahweh, remembering what he is and who he is, is going to become key. And remembering how he has come through. That second part of that verse, they trust in you because they know your name. They trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you. That is looking back. That is looking at the moments that God has not abandoned. Sometimes we have to look back to move forward. We get stuck, we get stumped, we're afraid, we're worried, the things are getting crazy, and looking back allows us to go, okay, this is when God did show up, and lean on that. It, remembering is, is so key. There are so many moments throughout the scriptures that the Israelites and Christians would do things to remember what God has done. Passover it is an uh, a annual festival um, celebrating the, remembering, remembering the time where God's spirit or the spirit of death came and, and killed the firstborn in, in Egypt and then rescued Israel out of slavery and bondage and brought them out of that. Remembering that with a yearly annual fest, festival, feast, time together, like a holiday, really. Uh, they had the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a time of remembering that they lived in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years in tents. I, I mean, we're going camping next weekend for a couple days. I can't imagine 40 years of it. And, but God supplied their needs in that time. Gave them manna, right? He was with them. And so that... This, uh, the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles would be reenacting that time by actually going camping. Like the, the, the Israelites, the Jews even nowadays, I have a friend who said, yep, uh, we've set up a tent in our backyard and we'll stay in that tent as a, as a way of remembering time where we, we as a people didn't have shelter, but God still came through and took care of us. There's the Feast of Weeks, that is to celebrate when God gave the, the law, the Ten Commandments to Moses. There's many, many times where people throughout the Bible would build a memorial, set up an altar to, to acknowledge, say, a covenant, to, to acknowledge a moment of something very special. When uh, Joshua, in Joshua 4, leads the Israelites into the promised land through the Jordan, they set up these, these 12 stones to commemorate and remember that moment. And just a few minutes ago, we took the Lord's Supper. And when Jesus instituted that ritual, he said... Do this in remembrance of me. We can be very fickle creatures. We can go, God's good and it's great, awesome, and then something new comes along and just upsets everything and go, God's, where is God at? I'm terrified, I'm freaking out. It's like, we got to remember what he's done and lean into that. There was a time when uh, my second born son was, he was just born, and we wanted to have a midwife because our experience with the doctors was not a great experience. So we're like, let's go with a midwife. Insurance didn't cover that. And so we basically drained our savings and we didn't have much at the time. We drained our savings to have this midwife birth. And so now we have our brand new son. Life is good. We've got like hardly any money in the bank, but things are okay. And in that paternity leave time and maternity leave for my wife, I get a call from my job that 
they're going to end my contract, that basically I'm unemployed, when I'm at an incredibly vulnerable moment. And I felt just a lot of grief. It felt like a very low point for me. And then God miraculously showed up. He still took care of me and my family. And then last year, I had a similar moment where I thought I was going to lose my job. And it was incredibly stressful as the sole provider for a family of five. And God provided a brother in our church who brought me a great job. And he came through. And now we're facing this strike that's throwing things you know, out the window at the moment. And it's, it could be stressful, but I need to remember, well, God came through for me last year. And he came through for me a few years ago. And, that's, and those are just big ones. He comes through every single day. And so and that, that's just my personal story, but I, I encourage all of us to try to do what you can to remember those times, right? When we go through them, it's scary. But when we have gone through it, when it came to pass, we can look back and go, wow, God was right there. And he will be again and again. So as we are in this time of waiting, we need to remember what Yahweh is as the sovereign supreme God. Who he is as our father, mentor, the lover of our souls, and how he has come through for us over and over again and will keep doing so. The second main point that I wanted to focus on from Psalm 9. First one was remembering Yahweh. The second one was not forgetting Yahweh. And I'm sure some of you guys are like, aren't those the same thing? <laughs> in a way, yes. But in a way, no. Um, there's plenty of times, it's a, like say, God remembered Noah. God remembered Rachel. God remembered his covenant with Abraham. Do those mean that God had forgotten? No. It, remain, it means that God is thinking of it. He's focused on it. He's devoting energy toward it. So I think in kind of the biblical mindset on, on words like remembering and forgetting, it's not just a binary of yes or no. It's more of a spectrum. And where remembering is giving attention to it. I, I'm focused on it. I'm thinking of it, on it. I'm giving energy to it, right? The neutral would be exactly that. Neutral. I'm not really thinking about it. I didn't really forget, but I'm not I'm not giving any energy to it whatsoever. And therefore, forgetting is actually putting energy in the opposite direction, it is turning your back to whatever it is that you're forgetting. In this case, Yahweh. Forgetting him is turning away from him. It's be, being in opposition to him. It's sin. In Deuteronomy 8.11, Moses is talking to the Israelites, be careful that you, do, you don't forget the Lord, your God, by failing to keep his commands, ordinance, and statutes that I'm giving you today. And then a few verses later in 19, he says, if you ever forget the Lord, your God, and follow other gods to serve them and bow and worship them, I testify against you today that you will certainly perish. So, Forgetting God is an act of rebellion and sin, and that is something we ought not to do because Moses said they will surely perish. Verse 17 of Psalm 9, our, our text for today, the wicked will return to Sheol all the nations that forget God. Sheol is a Hebrew word for grave, pit, the place of the dead. So death is all tied up with turning our backs to God. He's the source of life. We turn against him, it leads to death. Kind of as simple as that, really. Um, and so it says those who do forget God are going to be facing death and problems. And so when we look around this world, the justice that we're waiting for it hasn't quite come. I mean, we see it here and there. We see moments where, where God does bring that justice, that's for sure. I mean, we don't have... Nazis in the Third Reich right now, right? I mean, God, he still does it, but it's at a different time, and that's where we're waiting for it. But God will do it. Throughout this psalm, it talks multiple times about God's plan of retribution, of overthrowing oppressive forces and powers of darkness. Verse 3, it says, the enemies will stumble and perish. Verse 5, God rebukes and destroys the wicked nations. It actually says in verse 5 that he erased their names forever and ever. Erasing a name, right? Remember we talk about names are like an essence of 
your being. It's, it's, it's who you are, not just what you're called. And so being erased forever is being forgotten, right? So you forget Yahweh, you can be forgotten. Verse 15 says, The nations have fallen into the pit they made, their foot caught in the net they concealed. So often, part of why we are in a period of waiting for God's justice is because God kind of has it written in the programming of how this world works that there's going to be consequences of sin. And he's allowing us to have those consequences if we will not repent and come to him, right? And so God's good world, he, all things, he makes it, he makes all things, he calls it good, and he teaches how to live in his good world to preserve that goodness. Well, sin and forgetting him and turning our backs to him is going to lead to problems, right? And those problems will end up catching up. You give a man enough rope, he will hang himself, as, a, as I've heard it said. And so God being slow to anger <laughs> is saying, okay, I'm giving you time to repent, but you keep digging that pit and that's the pit you're going to fall into. Psalmist knows that God doesn't forget the evil and injustice. And in verse 12, he says, or the psalmist says, for the one who seeks an accounting for bloodshed remembers them. The one who seeks accounting for bloodshed is, is God, right? He remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the oppressed. Very early in the Bible, Genesis 4.10, Cain murdered his brother Abel, right? You might be familiar with that story. This is it's like the very beginning of the Bible here. God says, what have, your, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. It sounds very similar to what we just read in verse 12, Psalm 9, verse 12. And then on the very other end of the Bible, in, in Revelation, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God. These are folks who have been serving God and sharing his word and have been killed because of that and the testimony they had been given. They cried out in a loud voice, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long until you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? Even, even souls in, in the throne room are wondering, when is God going to do this? When is God going to bring that justice upon evil and overthrow these enemies? What's interesting is that the psalmist actually uses past tense throughout this psalm. For example, verses 5 and 6, but there's, there's plenty of them. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have erased their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to eternal ruin. You have uprooted the cities, and the very memory of them has perished. He says it in past tense, and yet, I, I don't know about you, but we can think of plenty of wickedness perpetuated in this world and yet the psalmist is saying as if God had already done it here's a riddle what is as trustworthy and undefeatable as God himself his promises his promises God says it he will do it and to the psalmist here he's writing things that have yet to happen at least fully happen in past tense because he trusts God and that it's as good as done, even though we are still in a place of waiting. We are waiting for him to undo the death and the darkness and bring that justice into this world. And so we, we need to remember him and not forget him and join those who do forget him. Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, to cut it off. He says, if your right eye is causing you to sin, to pluck it out. Now, I believe he's speaking metaphorically there, so I don't want to see anybody maiming themselves. But he is making a strong point that resisting sin and evil requires effort and sacrifice. And he says that it would be better for you to go through life without, with one hand and one eye than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
Sheol is also often translated as hell. When Jesus came on earth, he said the kingdom of God is at hand, right? If something's at hand, I can reach it. You know what I mean? It's, it's here. It's present and it's available for us to be in and take part of now and into eternity. The same is with hell. If you don't believe me, turn on the news for 10 minutes and you will see plenty of hell Heartache, bloodshed, death, destruction, fighting and bickering and just lack of peace and all this chaos in this world. And that is stemming from forgetting God. Forgetting him leads to sin. Sin leads to death. And that death is present in this world. And Jesus is calling us to make every effort to not forget him and be a part of that problem. Asking God, when are you going to rescue me from this sinking ship while drilling holes in the hull makes absolutely no sense. Forgetting God while we're waiting for him to bring ultimate restoration to our world makes no sense. But it's easier said than done, right? It's easier said than done. It's easier to say, yeah. Don't forget God, always think about him, put all of our energies to him, never forget him, never sin. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's why we need a savior. It is why we need Jesus. And so the final point um, that I wanted to share from Psalm 9 was called singing the correct tune. There are some translations of, of the Bible that have titles or headings for psalms. And this one says, A psalm of David for the choir director sung to the tune of the death of the son. Psalm 9. Psalm 9 had a lot of praise, a lot of beautiful moments. I will worship you, God. Thank you, God. You don't forget us, God. Sounds like it could be sung with joy, but it's sung to the tune of the death of the son. I don't think that's a happy melody, right? Now, that may have been a melody that was known in the time, in the culture. It may have been a song that, that David had written and sung after the death of one of his sons, like Amnon or, or Absalom. What I do see, though, for sure is that death Death is bad, right? <laughs> and death is part of it. And God has been trying to show us the consequences of forgetting him leads to death. From early on, right, in, in the Garden of Eden, eat of this forbidden tree, and that day you shall surely die. And death entered into this world. And so when God's bringing them into the temple and showing them, okay, do these sacrifices of atonement, it included the death of an animal so that it would just be so visceral, so obvious this is what sin does. It, it, it brings pain and death to the world around us and to ourselves. And so God, he, he's wanting us to realize that this, this, this evil perpetuated by the, his enemies is bringing death. And we can make that list of enemies Right? At the very beginning here, I, I thought, nah, I don't have any enemies, just people I don't like. But then when we stopped and thought about it, we can make a pretty good list of enemies. And I'm sure we can name more and more and more. But when I point a finger, I've got three pointed right back at me. I can't just point at people and say, you're an enemy of God, and he's going to bring death to you without three pointed right back at me. And it's key to remember I have done my fair share of perpetuating that death and destruction through sin in this world. And so we're waiting for God's justice? Well, we're in the now and not yet. Jesus took that justice. The one who lived the perfect life, never sinned, took that death for us. In Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, it's prophesying the Messiah. It's prophesying Jesus who will come and take all of the consequences of our sin, of what happens when we forget Yahweh as our God. He takes it on himself. 
Yet he himself, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains. But we in turn regard him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punished, punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way and the Lord has punished him, Jesus, for the iniquity of us all. I don't know what you, when I read the Bible, I've grown to see it as the Bible Project calls it a unified story. And I see less of this Old Testament, New Testament divide. But one thing is fairly, fairly clear is that in the Old Testament, oftentimes when it talks about enemies, it's people, right? Political, geographical rivals of God's people. And the New Testament, it's spiritual enemies, demons, the devil, right? The powers and principalities. Truly, they are one and the same, that behind the, the enemies of God are the spiritual enemies of God. But these human enemies were made in God's image, just like we, when we were yet enemies of God. Yet while we were sinners, Christ loved us enough to die for us. And so God wants to pull more and more of his kids out of the world of darkness and death where we are forgetting him and say, come and remember me, know me, experience my love and my goodness. That's a big reason why we're in a period of waiting. He's waiting for the tune of the death of the sun to be sung, the gospel to be shared to the ends of the earth so that more and more would come to repentance. The spiritual enemies God is definitely dealing with. They've lost their authority when Christ defeated death and rose on the third day. But they're not living like it yet. We're in that not now but not yet period of time. Their ultimate defeat is coming. But to use a parable of Jesus, God is not going to pluck out those weeds and pluck out the, the good plants at the same time. He's waiting until we have the harvest, more and more of people coming to know his gospel. And that is big reason why we're waiting. And so living our lives to the tune of the death of the Son, remembering to bring the, the good news that the one who is the source of life entered death to pull us out of that death and into new and eternal life. Amen? So while we are waiting, and yes, 2,000 years does feel like a long time, God is slow to anger, but he is just. That justice is coming. He wants more and more of his kids to remember him, right? And so there is this, I want to finish on a, on a little story here. My family, I just, I mentioned earlier, we, we went on some pretty cool trips. Recently, we just went to the island of St. Croix, which is one of the U.S. Virgin Islands. That's an island that used to have uh, the slave trade, African slaves. And in the 1730s, there were these two German missionaries, Dober and Nietzschmann, forgive me, <laughs> um, who felt this, this calling to bring the gospel, the, the death of the son, the one who shouldn't die has died so that we can live. They, they felt this burden ca calling to go to St. Croix and St. Thomas there's those islands, and minister to the slaves there and tell them about the new life possible in Jesus. And they weren't allowed. They were, they were blocked. St. Croix literally means cross. Croix is, means cross. They couldn't even go to an island named St. Cross to tell about Jesus' death on the cross. And that didn't stop them from bringing that, the tune of the death of the Son these missionaries sold themselves into slavery. They themselves became slaves 
and were shipped to St. Croix and St. Thomas to be amongst the slaves as slaves, telling them the good news and freedom that comes from Jesus Christ. And when they were leaving, they shouted out to their family, their loved ones on the shore as their boat was pulling away. What they shouted out was, may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And that reward is more people stopping forgetting him and remembering him and knowing him and experiencing life in him and him alone. That is the reward that Jesus died for. And so while we're in this waiting period, let us bring the tune of the death of the son that the lamb who was slain will receive his reward. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we know that you are good. We know that you are the prince of peace. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. And so we look out and we see problems in this world and it just feels like a disconnect. To be completely honest, Lord, to be just honest like the Psalms are honest. If you're on the throne, why is there pain in this world? But we know you and that you have a good and ultimate plan. And so we trust you. We know that we can't solve it. We look at the problems. What, we, we can name thousands right now of problems plaguing our individual lives, our community, our country, the globe. And we go, we have no idea how to fix this. And so we rely on you, our King of Kings. And in this time, God, please, help us to not grow weary in the waiting. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to not forget you and your sacrifice to live lives of remembrance of who you are, what you are, and how you've come through time and time again and will come through for the ultimate victory, the ultimate destruction of evil and pain. We know that will come. And thank you so much for your sacrifice and taking the bowl of wrath. God's wrath is totally justified against evil. But you, Jesus, drank it on our behalf that we might live. And so help us, God. Help us to help us live our lives to the tune of the death of the Son, where we work, where we play, where we go to school, where we shop in our social media interactions, any of our online correspondences, every element of our lives, God, help us to remember you and remember to bring your goodness to the world around us, that the lamb who was slain would receive the reward of your suffering. Amen. <laughs>